the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is risen. Christos was Chris. Christos Andiat. On this, the fourth Sunday of Pascha, we always have this reading of the healing of the paralytic at the, the pool in Bethesda. And these gospel lections that are chosen in this period after Pascha, many of them are allowing us after the resurrection to go back through key events in the life of Christ and to see him for who he is. As you recall, his disciples all throughout the gospels, they're confused. They don't know what to make of this man. Who is he? The, the storms listen to him. The demons listen to him. That the dead are raised, the lepers cleansed, so on and so forth. And yet, then they saw him die like a man, and they were perplexed. They didn't know what to make of all of this. But when he had risen, his resurrection bore testimony to them of who he was, that he was, in fact, the man, the very Son of God, from before all the ages. And so they, too, themselves had to go back and rethink and re-examine and reconsider each of the things that Christ had said and done in light of his cross and his resurrection. Well, so too now we are given that opportunity, and specifically the church places before our eyes many of the great miracles that Christ worked. And so today we hear of this healing of the man at the sheep's gate, at the pool of Bethesda. So hear the words of the Holy Evangelist St. John. He tells us first that Christ went up to Jerusalem for the celebration of a feast. And there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, meaning which had five porches. Now, this sheep pool was likely the place where they would take the animals, the sheep that were to be sacrificed in the temple, to cleanse and purify them before they would be taken into the temple precincts. This was where they were washed clean of any dirt or anything that might be on them before they were taken to be killed and offered to the Lord as a sacrifice. And so we have here an image, a, a place that sort of uh, focuses all of the main themes of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament. The sacrificial system that God gave to his people to help them to focus on and realize the depth of their sin. Just how traumatic it was to their human nature and to the world that this had to happen to try and make something right between God and man. <clears throat> and notice also that it is in a pool of water that this takes place. And the fathers point out over and over again that this was a symbol of baptism. That just as the animals were cleansed before their sacrifice and these people were healed miraculously of their bodily ailments, so too God was preparing the people for the time wherein He, the true Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, would go down into the waters to make those very waters the waters by which we could be healed, not simply of bodily ailments, of leprosy, of blindness, of being lame, of, of a flow of blood, or all these things that Christ healed, but we might be healed of our ultimate ailment, the very passions that turn us away from God, the spiritual ailments, the temptations we give into, and ultimately their fruit, which is death. And so here in the waters it says that there was a great multitude of sick people that lay about, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, all waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel would go down at a certain time and stir up the waters, and then whoever was first to step in would be made well of whatever disease it was that they suffered from. Well, this great miraculous power, brothers and sisters, has been offered to us not just every now and then when an angel stirs the water, but at every moment Christ calls us to baptism if we've not received it or to the second baptism of confession to heal ourselves of our ailments and St. Theophylact sees in these three categories categories of our spiritual states he says that we see here the sick and the blind 
Well, all of us are sick with sin, but the blind are those whose spiritual eyes have lost discernment. They're darkened, and we can't look at things and see properly what is good and what is evil. Doesn't that say so much about our times today, where the lines are blurred so often? We like to problemize the distinctions between good and evil, to justify things to ourselves, to, to make it so that we can do what we might want to. But if our eyes are clean, if they're pure, just as I can see properly everything that is before me, so too I can see what is right and what is wrong. So this is one of the things that Christ wishes to heal us of. Secondly, the lame were said to be there at that pool that day. And how many of us are spiritually lame? We are those who maybe we know what is good and what is wrong, but we don't have the power within us, it seems, to practice virtue, to struggle for our salvation, to make progress in our spiritual lives. Christ wishes to lay, raise up our lame limbs and heal them as well. And finally, there are those that were paralyzed, like the man we'll hear about today. And in the spiritual realm, the paralysis is one of either self-justification or despair. Because both of these, even if we see what is good and what is evil, even if we have within us the strength to struggle, if we have despaired of the hope of ever overcoming our sins, we won't struggle. And if we justify our sins to ourselves, if we say, it's just how I am, I was born this way, or this is from my upbringing, or I'm a Western New Yorker, this is just how we act, or these sorts of things that we might tell ourselves, it's the 21st century, this is how life is these days. If we justify our sins to ourselves, even though we know what is right is wrong, even though we might have the strength within us to struggle, we won't. So Christ wants to heal us of this twofold paralysis of either the pits of despair where we no longer think it's worth struggling, why bother, I'll never be any better, or we justify things to ourselves. Well, Christ came to the pool that day, and he came specifically to seek out the man about whom we heard. It tells us, there was a certain man who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now first, just think of the tragedy of this man's life. 38 years, 38 years, nearly four decades, he had struggled with and suffered from this paralysis. We're not told exactly how long he had been waiting there by the waters, but we get from his answer that he has been there for some time. He has been waiting for the opportunity, the hope against hope, that he will be cured of this paralysis of which he suffers. And in all that time, God was preparing him for this moment, for this encounter with Christ. Sometimes when we hear about the sort of spontaneity or the, 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 the quickness with which Christ heals someone, we tend to ask ourselves, why doesn't it happen like that for me? Why is it that St. Paul is one day going down the road, he's about to go kill Christians in Damascus, he sees a blinding light, and boom, suddenly he's preaching the gospel. But we have to see that there was a force story to that. There was a preparation. Paul was doing what he thought was right. And once he had that one piece of the puzzle put in place, he was able to correct everything else. Well, this man as well, we don't know the time of prayer and anguish and heart-wrenching cries to God that he put out in all those many years. But we know that their fruit was born this day. And we too have to do the same. We have to struggle. We have to seek we have to hope against hope. And so Christ comes to him and says, do you want to be made well? And the answer that the man offers is very interesting. He doesn't tell Christ to buzz off. He doesn't tell him, oh yeah, what do you think I'm doing here? He doesn't begin to complain. I've been here for 40 years. Who are you? Get out of here. Stop talking to me. Don't you see the pain that I'm in? Don't you understand what I'm struggling with? No, what he tells him is this. Sir, a sign of respect he starts with. I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. 
For while I am coming, yet another steps in before me. Many of the fathers understand that he's basically asking Christ, will you do this for me? The next time it stirs, can you please try and get me in there before the others? I've waited here year after year, hoping that my time will finally come where I will be the first into the waters and I will finally be rid of this paralysis that I've suffered from for so long. But you note, he neither complains about his situation, he doesn't curse God, and he also hasn't fallen into despair. He's still there. He's still hoping. He's still hoping that he will be the one that gets into those waters to be healed. And so too, each and every one of us, in our spiritual state, as we heard in the Traparian today, even as Christ raised up the man who was suffering from bodily paralysis, we hope to be raised from our spiritual ailments, from our spiritual paralysis, from our sins, from our temptations. And so there's an honest question that Christ poses to each and every one of us in this gospel this day as well. Do you want to be made well? And I say it's an honest question because if we're honest to ourselves, perhaps we don't. Perhaps we kind of like some of the things that we do in life that we know aren't right, that we know are destructive and not our true human nature, not what God has called us to be, of not in accordance with his commandments. We might like self-pity. We might like the sort of feeling we get from getting angry and frustrated at times. We may like the pleasures of this world. But we know deep down that this isn't the way we're supposed to be. And I hope and pray that at, at our deepest level, when we hear that question, do you want to be well? We say, yes, Lord. That is why I'm here. That is why I'm here in your holy temple, to be close to you, to receive you, to pray, to hear your holy words, to follow your example and the example of the saints. But we have to struggle, as I said, against that same paralysis, the two sides, the despair and the self-justification. We have to ask ourselves, do we want Christ truly to raise us up? from our self-love, from our gluttony and seeking after worldly pleasures, from our lust, from our love of material things and money and power, to spare us of our depression or spiritual listlessness, to free us from the bonds of anger and fear, of vainglory and pride and all the other countless passions that we are afflicted by on a regular basis. Do you want to be made well? well? What does Christ then do for the man? It's interesting. The fathers point out, he doesn't ask any sign of faith from him before healing him as he did in other cases. Do you believe that I can do this? He simply tells him, take up your bed, rise, and walk. Now what a what a strange thing to say to a man for 40 years has been laying uh, on, on a bed waiting for water to get into, to be healed. Rise and walk. Rise and walk. And yet this is what Christ says to each and every one of us as well. And if we have faith, as this man did, if we will make a firm resolution to rise from the bed of our passions, to walk in the commandments of God, and to take up our bed, our cross, and to follow him, he will heal us as he did that man that day. For that man rose up and to make clear that he had truly been healed. That's why Christ told him to take the bed upon his shoulders and to walk about, because it would make it all the more apparent to the people around, hey, that's the guy, he's, I've seen him sitting there for years. And now he's walking. How did this happen? And so too with us. People know us. People know what bed we lie on all the time. They know our temptations. They know our struggles. But if suddenly they see, hey, that person, they're always getting so angry with me. And yet they're just you know, bubbling over with joy. 
What changed? How did that happen? Or that person always seemed so down in the dumps, and yet now they're full of, of joy. What happened? When they see the bed on our shoulder that we've overcome, people will begin to say, what happened to them? And so it was with the man. Now Christ specifically carried out this act of healing, as it points out, on the Sabbath day. And obviously that's going to move the story along as to why the Jews get so upset with him. But he did so not simply because he was some sort of rule breaker, always having to go around and stick his nose in people's faces and, 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 and sort of you know, shake things up for them, a rabble rouser of sorts. Rather, Christ, once again, as with the symbol of the sheep pool, wanting to point forward from the Old Testament to the New, was trying to lead the people to see what the true purpose of the Sabbath had always been. The Sabbath was not a day simply to rest from labor and to have a certain set code. You can do this, you can't do this, you can do this, you can't do this. It was a day to rest from sin, at least once a week. At least once a week, make an effort to struggle and rest from sin and to give yourself time over to God. But as St. John of Damascus points out, Christ overthrew the Sabbath, not by saying, you don't have to keep this anymore, but by saying, every day now is the Sabbath. Your whole life now you are supposed to give to God. Your whole life is supposed to be dedicated to him. You should be resting from sin every day of the week, and you should be praying without ceasing, as St. Paul says. Well, then the Jews see this man carrying his bed about, and they say to him, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful to carry your bed. Haven't you read your Talmud? Haven't you read your rabbis? And he answered, Well, he who made me well told me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Well, who was this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed, this man, he didn't know. Because Christ, again showing us humility, he stepped aside. He'll do this again when we come to the healing of the blind man. The blind man doesn't know who it was. He just knows that he couldn't see and now he can. And so too, Jesus steps aside, only coming forward afterwards to the man to see him in the temple. And isn't that the great sign that this man had truly been preparing for this healing all throughout his life? What does he do when he's raised up? He doesn't go, Yahoo! I'm going to Disneyland, I'm going to the bars, I'm going to the, you know, the sports game, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to have all these pleasures, all this fun, you know, get with all the girls, all these things I've wanted to do my whole life, but I've been you know, just confined to this bed. No. Where is he found immediately after? He walks off, the Jews castigate him because he's carrying his bed, and where does Christ find him? In the temple. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, now you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And so, too, brothers and sisters, the temple is our goal as well. Here, this holy place, to commune of the holy mysteries, to be in the presence of Christ, to be with his people, to be with our brothers and sisters, to be in the presence of the saints. And so, if we have bodily ailments, if God heals us, it's not so that we can then go and live life to the fullest in the way the world thinks, but to live life to the fullest as Christ would have us do. And if we have afflictions in this life, as it says here, Christ said, told, told him, go forth and sin no more unless some worse thing come upon you. One that's a reminder that perhaps if we have great struggles in this life, be they things external to us, job situations, housing situations, difficulties in life, or things within ourselves, sickness, um, diff other difficulties, we should, one, look and see, is this a wake-up call? Do I need to straighten out my life? Has God given me this, this cross to bear because I've been too, um, to, you know, not been mindful enough? I've not been struggling enough? And we certainly shouldn't go around pointing out in other people Oh, you sinned, you did X, Y, Z, and that's why you got, you know, cancer or something like that. No, 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 no. But for ourselves, we can see that these things often come as a wake-up call. And a wake-up call that we may be punished a little bit here, 
and wake up and not receive the punishment of eternity. This is God's ultimate care for us. This is why he allows evils and pains into our life now to wake us up so that struggling here for a little while, seeking healing here for a little while, we may be eternally with him in the glory that the temple could only prefigure. So brothers and sisters, Christ poses this question then to you this day. Do you want to be made well? I pray that you will say yes. I pray that you will rise and follow his commandments and struggle for your salvation. Amen.